Okay, so Hamatobi Tattoo. It is an extension of Mountain Loaf Tattoo, which I assume only a few of you know. Um, so why should you care? It brings a lot to the table. There's several awesome principles in construction, such as propositional truncation, which basically converts any type into a logic, a logical proposition. Uh, quotient types, which are data structures which identify equivalent elements. For example, fractions like uh, one over two and two over, two over four. There's no reason why they shouldn't be treated the exact same. Um, constructive proofs, so when you prove something exists, you do it by actually constructing it, and you can uh, run, you can extract the proof and then run the program that you extracted and actually construct the object. Um, now the two main things are unibalance and higher inductive types. Uh, both of these mean much, much simpler proofs. Uh, it eliminates the need for converting back and forth between types, so imagine no more word proofs. Um, it un unifies enormous yet separate fields of study, so uh, cat category theory, topology, type theory, logic, and physics. Uh, type theory provides a language for category theory, which you then use to speak about whatever theory you're working in, like, um, like quantum mechanics. So, all right, so we want to make proving things that are equal. We want to make proving things that are equal easier, right? So base two and base ten representations, you should just be able to substitute them freely without a kind of world. Uh, we want to give us another way to think about logic. So what computer tap theory does is that we can do it in terms of 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 spaces and geometry because you know, thinking graphically is a powerful tool. Uh, we want logic and mathematics to be easier to formalize and check mechanically, and if possible, we want to be able to extract programs from our proofs. So, some background. Martin Loaf type theory is the standard dependent type theory. Um, basically it means terms can depend on terms, like, like always, basically. Uh, types can depend on types, so you can you know, construct functions, you can, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Uh, terms can depend on types, which is polymorphism and generics from like C sharp, and yeah. And what's special about dependent types is that types can depend on terms, so an example of that would be a dependent function where the return type of the function can return on the input value. For example, if you have a function on booleans, then if it's true, you might return an integer. If it's false, you might return a string. Uh, okay, so inductive types. They are basically tagged unions of structures for in C, but they're more theoretically sound, basically. <coughs> Uh, types are thought of as mathematical sets in normal type theory. Uh, so you just have a collection of objects, and each possible value of the type is an element of that set. It's the basis of most modern proof systems, such as Koch, Agda, Idris, Newpel, and so on. But notably, it's not the basis of Isabel Hull, which is based on Hull. <coughs> Uh, it's also the basis of most dependently type programming languages such as Agda, Idris, and Epigram. So, the first thing we have to talk about is the Curry Howard isomorphism and constructivity. The Curry Howard isomorphism is basically logical propositions are types. A of type A is, can be interpreted as A is a proof of the proposition A. To prove a proposition constructively, we must provide an actual proof of it. That means we can't use double negation. This seems like it would be an arbitrary restriction, which does nothing to help you. But it means type checking and proof checking are two names for the exact same process. It's like Haskell's of all type programs can't go wrong, but on steroids. So this is just a quick uh, comparison of types and logic. 
um, in Martin Luther type theory. So true is equal to the type with one with one element. Uh, P and Q is a, a tuple of P and Q. <coughs> Implication is just a normal function. Uh, P or Q is um, a is a enumeration basically. Okay, so the identity type. This is how the identity type is defined in intentional Martin Luther type theory, where you have a type of big A and then to construct a value of A equals B, you there's the reflexivity constructor which is A equals A. Uh, sorry, which is of type A equals A. It means trivial equality, so purely syntactical equality. Like you have to you check each bit of the representation and so on. If that's equal, then it's uh, syntactically equal. So some properties of equality: uh, reflexivity, everything is equal to itself. Transitivity: if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And symmetry. If A equals B, then B equals A. This is, is it, it's a quad. So, the new interpretation that homotopy type theory brings is types of spaces, elements of points, and the quality is a path between a point, between two points. And can you make out that on the picture? I'm not sure how the resolution of the of the projector is, but. So in the top picture, we have a, a space, big A, and we have a point in that space of little a, and we, that's how we interpret A of type A. <coughs> Probably should have chosen better variable names. Um, reflexivity is the identity path. We don't move, it, it's, it's, we go nowhere, because it's trivially equal. So we can walk on a path in both directions. It's symmetric. And we can join two paths together if they share a common endpoint, which is transitivity. Now, geometric intuition can help us do logic in type theory, which means that techniques from topology can be used in type theory and vice versa, which is pretty amazing if you ask me. Now, there's something weird about identity. It turns out that within the theory itself, we can't actually prove that reflexivity is the only way to prove equality. Now, there's three approaches you can take based on this information. The first is to ignore it. Um, you just carry on as normal and just don't think about this. The second approach is to state, just flat out by an axiom saying, every proof of equality is reflexivity. So, so every constructor of equality is reflexivity. It provides good, good properties for pattern matching. Um, that's every type is also a set as as before. But we don't have to do that. We can embrace this fact and generalize data type definitions to allow new equality proofs to be defined. These are called higher inductive types. For example, the circle. This is in pseudo Haskell notation. So there's a base point of base in S1, which is just like a normal constructor. And what higher inductive types bring are the loop constructor of base equals base. Note that this is by definition not equal to reflexivity. Another example is the interval of 0, 1, and then 0 equals 1. So, what the hell did we just do? This up here is a representation of the circle using the new constructor. Um, it leaves out the trivial reflexivity constructor, which you can just think of as another small loop here. So, we define an element of S1 base, which is a point. But we also define loop, which is a path. This is fundamentally different to any existing type in, in Martin Luther type theory up until now. Uh, it, 
all existing types have been set, which means all of their proofs on quality have been uniquely reflexivity and boiling. One, there's one proof of equality between two elements of the set, which is reflexivity. Therefore, S1, which is the mathematical name for the circle, is not a set. It is called a homotopy of one type, which I was bring that on. So, equivalences. The simplest definition is a pair of functions <coughs> which are inverse to each other, where they compose to be equal to the identity. Uh, for example, converting an integer between base 2 and base 10. That's a perfect example. Uh, we can think of equivalence as a path between two types as well. Starting from A, this is how you get to B, vice versa. Now, equality is trivially an equivalence. The functions f and g are just id. It allows nice where nice is not, like it's not depending explicitly on the representation, which turns out to be rarely needed. Uh, it allows functions defined in one type to be to work on equivalent types. It's annoying having to transport these functions by composing them, but we'll talk about that later. So what's a homotopy? Uh, a homotopy is a path between paths that is an, an equivalence of two equivalences, I should say. So think of a piece of string attached at two endpoints and it's loose. You can move it around with your finger to rearrange the string and as long as it stays connected and the endpoints are the same, you're basically homotopically manipulating it. So yeah, the endpoints are the same, you get to the same spot. Now a path between a path is also a path. So that means homotopies can have homotopies, and homotopies over homotopies can have homotopies, and so on. This infinite tower of homotopies creates what's called an omega groupoid, where omega is a type of infinity, basically. Uh, now this is trivially generated with the reflexivity constructor, but remember, reflexivity is not the only identity constructor. So this is an example of a groupoid. I only just showed two levels because I, I don't want to draw an infinite picture. Um, so the back points, they're just points of a set which are equal. The arrows going between them, they're two examples of proofs of equality. And then the double arrow between the two lines is a homotopy. So if you dualize this so that the uh, these two paths they become points and then this is just a normal path between them which is basic which is basically cutting off the bottom layer and then letting the rest fall down on the foundation and you can see how that uh, you can treat paths as just another type with elements so yeah that should be fairly straightforward. What? We call that we are using a new intuition after all. Types of spaces, elements of points, and equalities of paths. Remembering the properties of equality, reflexivity, transitivity, and symmetry. Types equipped with relations that satisfy, satisfy these properties are called groupoids. You can transform any path to itself. So if you have a path of A equals A, then you also have the reflexivity constructor of that path. So P equals P. You can also concatenate paths and you can reverse paths. So that means we have groupoids over groupoids. So the univalence axiom. An equivalence is a pair of transformations between two types. <coughs> Every element of A can be mapped to an element of B and vice versa. Functions on A can be transformed to functions on B by composing with equivalence maps. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if we could say every equivalence is an equality? Which, this is what univalence is. We say for all A and B, where A and B are types, 
A is equivalent to A, uh, A is equivalent to B is equivalent to A equals B. So that means we are upgrading what equivalence means to be equality. Now, homotopy n types. This um, this is one of the new things which higher reductive types bring. So a negative two type, which is a stupid name, but yeah, what can you do? It is equivalent to the, the type of just a single element. It can be shrunk down to just that element. A negative one type is called a mere proposition where every proof of equality of a negative one type is reflexivity. So that's this is where logic goes, where like A and B implies C. Every logic, every proposition is a mere proposition. Now a zero type, that is what we call sets, where every proof of equality between the elements is a mere proposition. So this is the formal mathematical definition of these, where is contra means is contractible down to a single point. So I'll just put that down for a second and just wait and absorb it. So looking back, it's an interpre interpretation of, of dependent type theory by types of topological spaces, elements of points, equality and equivalences are paths. It reveals intimate connections between topology, logic, type theory, category theory, physics, and so on. It allows proofs and intuition from any of these domains to carry over to all of the rest. Uh, extended with the univalence axiom, which is A is equivalent to B is equivalent to A equals B, or in other words, another way of expressing it is equivalence of types is equivalent to equality of types. And in mathematics, there's a people often work up to up isomorphism, which is basically a fancy name for working by analogy. Uh, equivalences explain why A equals B in addition to how to get from A to B, whereas reflexivity just says, here we are. Higher inductive types allow a uh, generalization of inductive types to allow equality constructors in addition to standard type constructors, and they allow many new constructions such as propositional truncation, <coughs> uh, the integral, and spheres, and so on. So, uh, it's a geometric interpretation of type theory, and it is rather revolutionary. It's only happened in the last few years. It has the potential to vastly increase the power of proof assistance and simplify theorem proving. It makes common informal practice rigorous and it. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> uh, any questions? So, for the questions, anyone? Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of times that the, the simplifies proof of makes the power of proof systems uh, yep. increasing, it makes proofs easier and so on. Uh, can you give a concrete example? Uh, okay, so word types, uh, word proofs rather, where you're converting back and forth between uh, words of 10 bits in length and words in of 20 bits in length, for example. Um, by flat out, by constructing an equivalence of, if you have a, if the bit length of one is less than the other, and you make sure you, and the, and the function you find in the high to low direction is only over the, the allowable representation of, sorry, the allowable values of the smaller, at length, uh, which you can specify as a type. Uh, since you've constructed an equivalence, you can declare an equality. So that means basically no more casting. It means you can pattern match on it in any way you choose. It um, uh, that's probably 
is the easiest way to explain it for that sort of word drift type thing. Um, there's also things like... Uh, Doesn't that just mean the group obligation from the individual thing when you're proving about a specific example to proving about a more complicated general case where you have to prove that all the time your downcast operation is safe, for example? So can you rephrase that? So you said that so all you need to do to, to um, establish this over word types is that if you want to prove that there's an isomorphism or an equivalence between yeah. the two, like say 10 bits and, and 32 bit words, um, you have to show that the, the function you're defining on top of um, the downcast operation, because that's where you lose information, yeah. uh, adheres to some sort of um, satisfiable property that says that nothing bad happens if you do the downcast. But right. it only depends on information that will be preserved by the downcast. Right, that's... Isn't the proof then, you're just moving the proof from the individual thing that you want to prove to a proof about the type itself? No, you're moving it from a proof to the type, and the type checker is the one that actually proves it. Um, basically, I mean, yeah, you've got to write the, the theorem once, but once you have that, if you can show that um, that this thing is always going to be less than whatever, then you can do it. Sure, which, but for every right. specific example, you have to prove that for for your your thing to be a resident in that type, it has to satisfy the property that you've established. Um, well, no. Uh, if you you can't construct it if it's not a resident, if it's not an allowable value in the first place. So, uh, so what I think you're saying is, if you have forty-two, for example, and you want to show it's a, it's a three-bit byte, um, a three-bit word, sorry, you simply can't construct forty-two as a value of a three-bit word. So there's no way you can. Convert. You can. There's no way you can construct it in the first place to talk about it. It's it's literally an, an absurd proposition. And yeah, the only way you can do it is from from uh, from false, basically. Any other question? Um, do you propose to always adopt full full false keys action? I can think of situations in geometry uh, where it's not always valid. So right. would it be valid in your application? Right. Um, it is completely orthogonal to like the higher inductive types and so on. So it is certainly an option to not include it. Uh, <laughs> it depends entirely on which model you're working in. So um, it holds, for example, in groupoids, in simple sets, uh, cubical sets. Pre sheaves, pre, uh, any, well, at least it's conjectured to hold, rather, in any uh, Omega topos. And, like, it obviously won't work if, it won't work for everything, but it is independent of the existing axioms, so it won't break anything if. It won't break anything if you can add it, and it won't break anything if you can't add it, basically. And of course, a relevant question if it's useful in your application domain to improve on the yeah. uh, Wait, sorry, what was that? So, is, is it relevant to use this axiom in the application to improve the system? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, this is. I was going to improve a sample proof, but I didn't think I'd have enough time to explain it, but um, an example is proving the homotopy group of spheres, uh, which is basically the all the different, um, sorry, the fundamental group of spheres, which is proving all the different paths you can take on a sphere. Um, without using univalence, it's a lot harder because, for example, it means you don't get function extensionality, you don't get uh, and then you get interval times. Uh, you have to convert back and forth all the time, and you can only show that it is equivalent to the integers rather than being equal to the integers. Um, so that means you, unless you write a special 
for thought you can't use rewrite rules, for example. Um, and anything that depends on equality, you will not be able to use because homotopy is only up to equivalence, basically. I wanted to give an intuition that is maybe easier to understand for example. Um, on, so if, if you take uh, reasoning up to isomorphism, for instance, we have uh, the syntax of programs in, in C, if we do our C chorus proofs, for instance, and uh, we wrote the whole auto chorus tool to put that into a um, shallow embedding, which is equivalent, um, so that we can do rewriting on it. So we can just, uh, because in the shallow embedding, if two things are have the same semantics, they're actually equal, and you can just replace one with the other. In the syntax, that is not true. Um, this kind of theory will allow you to say, well, the syntax that the, you know, the set of um, syntax programs are actually um, isomorphic to the shallow embedding, and therefore they're equal, so um, I can now start using the simplifier on the, on the syntax with semantic arguments, basically. So I prove something is semantically equivalent, um, two completely uh, different looking statements are do the same thing, and therefore I'm allowed to say program X is syntactically equal to the other <coughs> program, uh, program X, because I used another equality. So that, that is something you can do, which you cannot currently do it in this well or pretty much any other proof system. So you can't do it. You can't do it in copy there, no. So that's... It's not copy as in... Uh, you can add the balance as an axiom to cop, and it will work, but it won't be constructed. So, homotopy type theory is a lot better. Yeah, it's only a couple years yeah, old. Yeah, but I know that it's easier to extend it out. So yeah, it's not good much. That's right. Uh, and I just assume somebody did it on that. Right. Uh, there, is, there is working done on libraries on hot in cock. Uh, but when you're extracting the post, once it hits the univalence axiom, it doesn't know what to do, and it just buffs and fails, basically. So it will type check and it will prove stuff, but yeah, if it ruins the constructivity of the problem. Yeah. As I understand it, a lot of what we can try to prove is not equivalence, but uh, refinement. This is not better. A lot of what, sorry? What we were trying to prove is not the right. domain equivalence. It's that uh, the program you get is a refinement of the specification we've got. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, it, I'm not quite sure how it would help in that specific case because, you know, it, it's a subset rather than an equivalent. But if you could, um, you could probably prove a lot of, you could probably use equality for a lot of the supporting stuff. And so. Like um, yeah, like work is a simple example. Um, colors type stuff where you um, saying something is equal other than fine. So like um, I guess yeah. Final question. 